there's a lot of things about food and foodie culture um, that are very easy, you know, to make fun of. My name is Emily Flake. I'm a cartoonist, illustrator, and writer in New York City. I cartoon primarily for The New Yorker. Any group that I'm a part of, I feel like, is is fair game. I do a, a fair amount of um, of jokes about, you know, jokes about moms and jokes about, about the kind of person who goes to farmer's markets and, you know, has this self-satisfaction that is important to address when you're making jokes. We've lost so much of food's place in our culture as that's been replaced by a mechanized version of it or a corporate version of it. It doesn't have as much to do with our history and our hearts anymore. I think that the movement towards understanding where our food comes from and what our food is really speaks to that loss. People get very invested in the story of their food because we no longer have the story of ourselves. You know, the food of the early 80s was a woeful, woeful thing. It's such a sea change from when I was a kid, and it, we're having conversations about it in a way that I feel we were not having in, in, you know, in the 70s or 80s, say. Although in the 70s and 80s, my conversations about food were like, I will only eat the Cheerios and the banana. I also think that things move and change so quickly that, you know, more things are thrown at you more quickly than they would have been 30, 40 years ago. So I feel like the, the life of a food trend is much shorter these days. I imagine that fondue was popular for more than two months. I feel like it had a few years in there where that was a thing. But now I feel like, you know, everybody loves truffles, nobody loves truffles. Or, you know, everybody loves bacon for a second, and then, you know, or matcha powder. Nice things that people get very excited about for a few minutes and then and then forget about it. I think it, it just had it's such a churn at this point. I fear that because of that people will decide they're they're sick of trying to you know eat responsibly or support small farms and that again is a danger of that of that kind of churn and I, I hope that that's not the future of things but if people feel too just burnt out on something, you know, then they're gonna stop paying attention and I think that's too bad. Because of the sort of self-satisfaction inherent in being the kind of person who, and I am this kind of person because I do shop at farmer's markets and I try to buy, you know, meat that went to college and to the whole nine yards. So there's, you know, there's a self-congratulatoriness that needs to be um, taken down a peg or two. You know, food transparency, food responsibility, it's a thing that is both, it's personally important to me, and it's a thing that's easy to make fun of. And I'm glad I live in a world now that I am able to be aware of where our food comes from and what our food is. This was not, I feel like, an available thing when I was a kid. I feel like you either grew up on a farm or, you know, you just got the meat from, <laughs> from the meat store. But the fact that these choices are increasingly available is, I think, a net good. And I think that the rising popularity of this kind of thing hopefully is a net good for small farmers and small businesses and, you know, people with a real connection to the thing that they're, that they're making. <laughs>